mic on? Um, I'm going to uh, begin by thanking everybody who is here tonight. It's, uh, I was thinking, talking to my wife earlier, that it's like being among friends, because I know so many of you uh, as contributors to this idea, this big idea. But it's actually more like being among family, because as Ollie and Anne-Marie have said, uh, I've known many of you for many, many years, and there are people in this audience who have literally walked into a prison in Africa to get me out. So thank you. Um, and thank you, Ollie, for reading that list of, of partners, because that saves me the task, and uh, my list is even longer, because there are a lot of unspoken people. But we have limited time tonight, so uh, let me get right at it. The first thing I'd like to show you um, is not the Harvard University Information <laughs> Technology um, email. I just want to show you this map. Bear with me, it's silent. Bingo. We can bring the lights up again. Um, can you hear me? Is, this, is the lav mic on so I can walk? Okay. Um, I showed that uh, to my father-in-law, who's a rancher in West Texas, and he said, uh, what's the big deal, Paul? That took all of 30 seconds. And then tonight, before I came here, I did a calculation on my phone. And that was 30 seconds long. And if I actually extended it out to the actual length of the journey I'm about to undertake, the journey is 1,051,200 times longer than that journey that just was uh, shown up there. The red line is me. And I'm going to walk that journey starting in January. It's a journey that our ancestors made between 50 and 70,000 years ago. It's a journey that many scientists tell us uh, was a formative one for our species because as we moved along across the surface of the planet, we innovated our way across the planet. We became a troubleshooting species. We adapted to different environments. Um, we overcame major obstacles like glaciers, like predators the size of Volkswagen beetles, like droughts and famines and in the process became truly human. So I have another alternate name for this whole undertaking. It's the long walk into our becoming. And starting in January, I will set out from the Rift Valley of Ethiopia, from an ancient man site called Hertoburi in the Afar region, and I will head out north with Afar nomads and cross about three dozen borders, three continents, scores if not hundreds of languages, depending on the routing, scores if not hundreds of ethnic groups, depending on the routing. It's a journey of about 30 million footsteps and a journey of at least seven years of my life. Now, when I project this map, and I've, I did it to, to a lot of school kids recently. In the last month, I went on a school tour organized by one of my partners, the Pulitzer Center. And invariably at this phase, the kids would raise their hands and say, Paul, we get the idea. We, we understand it's pretty cool, the concept, that you're going to go out and you're going to go walk across the world along the pathways of the first anatomically modern human beings to colonize the planet. You're going to... You're going to carry a microlight laptop. You're going to carry a video cam. You're going to carry uh, a digital recorder. You're going to carry a satellite phone to, to upload this material in the middle of deserts, on rivers. Um, but why walk, right? Why walk? That's, that's what everybody gets hooked on. Um, it's the inevitable question. Why not just hail a cab? Why not take a mutatu? 
why not to, um, take a plane, cash in all your frequent flyer miles from your foreign corresponding days? Um, the answer that I give people is twofold. There are two main reasons, like two solid legs. And I think there are two basic attributes of being human. One is storytelling, and one is what I'm doing now, which is walking. A, B, A, B, A, B, A, B. And if I could go about four more paces, I'd have an iambic pentameter. I think walking is one of the fundamental heartbeats of good storytelling. In my case, it's journalism. It's pacing, it's rhythm, it's slowing down enough to absorb a story through your skin and not just through electronic media, although I will be using electronic media. And to get at the, the heart of this project, the, the, two, the, two prime, the, the two other legs, which is science and art, let me just focus on the science part first. And bear with me, folks who've heard this a little bit before, you, my friends from MIT have been subjected to, to these factoids. How, much, how far do you think the average American walks in a year? Any guesses, anybody who's a grunner or a walker? Well, it's all over the place, right? Any guess you could give me would be valid because if you take a group of 300 million people, you're gonna find people who don't walk at all and people who walk like, like crazy. But the studies I've found show that there are groups of people in car-bound cultures in Southern California, urban cultures that, that walk as little as 40 meters a day, which when you add that up, comes up to 90 measly miles a day. And there are the average more people who are active, who bicycle, who jog, on average do about two and a half, three miles a day. And when you add that up, that's about 1,200, 1,300 miles. That's, that's what a healthy average American does today. Now, what about um, the kind of people who walked out of Africa in the Pleistocene? Those ancestors, those restless forebears who spread out, radiated out of the continent and basically conquered the world, allowing us to become a planetary species. How far do you think the average hunter-gatherer walks? Any guesses on that one? Because the number is really specific. Studies have been done. They've, they've wired GPSs to um, people in Tanzania who still hunt and gather on the savannas there, the Hadza people. They've done the same to hunter-gatherers in the Amazon. And despite the difference in habitats, they walk an amazingly similar amount in a day, in a year. Any guesses on that one? 20 miles. 20? Okay. 10? Bingo. 10 men, hunter-gatherers, walk about 9 to 10 miles a day. Women, who mainly gather, about 6. So when people say, Paul, what you're doing is extreme, what you're doing is extraordinary, it may be even lunatic, what I come back with is the number. For 95% of our species history, we walked on average 3,200 to 3,500 miles a year. Now, that walking wasn't in a straight line, of course. No hunter-gatherer moves to the environment that way. They radiate out from hearths and come back, often coming back with stories, the other half of my, my premise. Um, and so when you, when you think about that, that is like walking from Boston to the West Coast, to Portland, every single year of your adult life. And that is what is normal. That is what we are designed to do, the superb mechanism for walking that we're endowed with through evolution, through adaptation, natural selection. We are walking machines. So walking across the US one year, turning around, walking back to Boston, turning around, walking back to the West Coast, that's normal, and that's what I'm returning to. And what you guys are doing, as you all know, is extreme. Sitting down is very extreme. 
it's an extreme sport. It takes a real toll on your body, as you all know. We're just not designed to do it. When I hang out with hunter-gatherers, as I have with, with people, the Mbuti Pygmy, I'm trying to look for a table that I could stand on, but I'm afraid like Teddy Roosevelt probably used these or something, so um, I'm wondering, will that one support me? When, when you hang out with hunter-gatherers, you don't see them doing what you guys are doing, and it's not just because they don't have chairs. They do sit down, they sit down on the ground, and they spread their feet, and they smoke, or they eat. But what you see them doing a lot of is this, right? For hours. I mean, I've been around campfires where they do this most of the night, talking, again, telling stories. My legs start quivering after about 45 minutes, but even at rest, they are ready to do this at a moment's notice. When their predators around, you get on your feet fast. So I'm just making a point here that scientifically, I'm on pretty solid ground. That what I'm returning to is the way we moved through the world originally for the bulk of our history and the way we absorbed information through 95% of our history and the way we disseminated stories, going out, coming back, meeting other people along the way, swapping stories about where resources were, or actually, in some cases, having swapping stories that were belligerent, that triggered conflict. We moved at this pace. We moved at five kilometers an hour, about three miles an hour, through the world and through the quote unquote news of our day. The other pillar, the other leg of why I'm proposing to take this long walk, which I'm calling out of Eden, and I'm referring to it as in the paleoanthropological sense, the Eden that we all sprang from, the, the Rift Valley of East Africa. And I'm gonna lay for aside for the moment the debate over whether the origin of Homo sapiens uh, was in Southern Africa where new work is being done or East Africa. I'm gonna start up in East Africa because it saves me about 3,000 kilometers of walking. I'm gonna be expedient here. Um, the other pillar of why I'm going to do this trip is much more literary. It's about poetry. It's what I'm calling slow journalism. It's a term I thought I had coined until I got on the web and, and somebody else had thought of it uh, actually years ago. Um, but I, as a foreign correspondent, started to wonder what I was missing by covering the world so intensely. Covering, it's an interesting verb. I would fly into stories, I would spend days, weeks, sometimes months, because I'm an immersive reporter. I would get the goods, I would write the story, I would go home, or I'd write the story at home. I would go on to story B, do the same, go on to story C, do the same. But as I flew home, as I drove to the airport, I began to wonder about the stories that lay in between. And this is the poetry part. I began to wonder if the stories that we drive through or fly over or chatter through or ignore or, or do not have the time and patience to slow down enough to listen to are actually the more important stories. Because think about it, as our world globalizes, whatever that thing means, that's a big vague abstraction that nobody can really get their head around, we are most certainly getting knitted together, wittingly or unwittingly, willingly or unwillingly, our economies, our lives, our cultures, our languages are approaching each other. These invisible lines of connection. So this walk is about the poetry of connections, hidden connections that I have missed as a writer and foreign correspondent for much of my career because I was too busy and too obsessed to get to story A and story B and missing the even more important connective tissue between story A and story B. And that's what I'm hoping to discover on this walk. I'm hoping that the walk also improves my work in some way I can't even begin to imagine yet. What will walking, what will the pace of a heartbeat do to my sentences? That compels me as much, and I think it's a factor of getting older, as the raw journalism itself, art. If my work doesn't evolve as I walk out of Africa, as I reach the Levant, as I move into, the, into Central Asia, 
if my work stays the same, then I think a fundamental part of my journey will have failed. And I have no idea how to measure that failure or success by yet. I'll find out. So, walking. The route, I'm going to uh, ask that the lights be brought down one more time and I'll walk you guys metaphorically through the route. As planned, the route starts in Ethiopia and it goes up to the Red Sea where according to scientists, as few as a few thousand human beings crossed the Bab el Mandeb Strait and spread, began spreading across the world. And if you buy into this analysis, we're all descended from those 2,000 or so people, a bottleneck. Everybody outside of Africa, that is. I'll move up into the Levant, and my first year will end either in Amman or in Jerusalem. I'll stop there for a while, recover, write, report, and then move on through the Middle East. How through the Middle East? This line is very vague. It depends on the situation of the day, the borders of the week of the month, how they harden, how they soften up. Move along through Central Asia, through the foothills, the southern foothills of the Himalayas, through northern China, excuse me, through southern, uh, through northern India, then through uh, Yunnan province, through China, that I have calculated will take as long as 14 months to get through China alone on foot. And then uh, this map is a little bit deceptive because it shows me going all the way up to the Arctic Ocean to the Chukchi Peninsula and the Bering Strait. I'm going to go up through Siberia as far as I can get until the winters start seriously slowing me down. So it could be Vladivostok, it could be Magadan, whatever. I will cross this Bering Strait by boat and then ramble on down the western flank of the New World all the way to Tierra del Fuego at the very tippity tip of Latin America which archaeologists say our ancestors arrived at about 12,000 years ago. Okay, we, we can bring the lights up one more time. I'm calling this slow journalism idea, I'm, 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 what I originally was thinking about it, and there's a colleague here in the room who helped me come up with this notion, is it's going to be modeled on the aesthetic appeal of the slow food movement, which is, of course, we've all eaten industrial foods. Um, they sustain us to some degree. They're nutritious to some degree, um, but they're somewhat tasteless. I want to go back to a tradition of moving slowly through stories, of gathering information slowly through stories, imbuing stories with meaning by spending enough time in one place to get into people's lives, which is a humbling experience for any journalist to be admitted through the door. But not long enough that I become jaded with the story the way indigenous reporters sometimes do, by inhabiting the story themselves through their lifetime. That's another poetic concept that I'm hoping to explore the boundaries of being a nomad, but not being too fast a traveler. Boundaries of having the advantages of coming into a story with fresh eyes, but staying long enough to inhabit the story, to get to know it well, but not become jaded by it. To not develop those blinkers that we accrue when we stay in one place too long, we stop seeing things anymore. Hopefully, those five kilometers an hour are the right pace. And I argue they are because everything about us, including our neurons, are designed to absorb information at that pace. Um, what kind of stories? We're here tonight specifically to talk about storytelling, about journalism. So I'm not going to go too much into the science uh, as I have before. I'm not going to go too much into the education as I have before. What kind of stories will come out of this walk? Well, a lot of them will be stories, the kinds of stories thematically that I've written before. Stories about climate change, stories about uh, resource conflict, stories about cultural endurance, um, stories about political change. But I, some of these stories I'll be, I'll be being revisiting because I've covered about two-thirds of the route and I'll be able to use personal history uh, to compare what I'm seeing on foot 
with what I'm seeing now. Countries that were falling apart before have knitted themselves back together, and some of them have experienced the opposite fate. And then there'll be new stories because I'll be walking through entirely new areas of the world that I've never been before, including China and Russia. I'm gonna give you a, a brief um, slideshow tour of some of these, of these ideas and stories, and then we can go on to uh, some, some Q&As because I wanna have your guys' questions improve this idea. So story, a story that revolves around locomotion, that revolves around human migration or human dispersal, quite naturally will, will deal with human migration. Um, I'm going to be moving with large groups of people. These are our migrant workers in China. This is a mass migration. It's the largest in human history. At one point, about 130 or more Chinese were moving out of villages to find work in urban areas. It's tapering off now, but I'll be traveling with crowds sometimes. And on other times, I might be traveling alone or with very few people. And this example is taking a horse over the Hindu Kush to cover the fall of Kabul, um, taken by a good friend of mine named Pete Souza, who's now shooting Obama's White House. That's a generator on the, on the horse behind me. Um, I'll be writing environmental stories. This is a, a skipper from an industrial northern country who is plundering the protein sources off of Angola. All those fish he threw over the side because they weren't the right uh, species that brought a good price. I'll be talking about economic stories. In this case, this is a, a photograph from Somaliland, uh, a tiny quasi-independent republic almost nobody has heard about. They print their own money. These are Somali currency here, bricks of it. This is a money market. Stories about human displacement, refugee movements. This is a man sleeping in what was the lobby of a former Italian five-star luxury hotel in downtown Mogadishu. and stories about some of the causes of, of this displacement, right? The most notorious one being human conflict. These are, this is, uh, again, Pete's uh, photos from the front in Afghanistan, B-52s dropping 500-pound bombs on the Taliban with the roots of, of institutionalized human violence. Be writing good stories, too. These are children in East Africa. I'm really looking forward to digging my fingers again into good African stories. Africa as a continent is coming up economically. It's got six of the 10 fastest growing economies in the world. It's wiring up to the digital age. And apropos of that, stories about my business, the media, right? Who gets to tell the story in the age of the web that's democratized information? Is it a skinny foreign correspondent taking pictures of a Dasanich nomad in Kenya? Or is it a very buff Afar nomad in Ethiopia who's just used his cell phone to take a picture of me taking a picture of him? This was about a month ago. I love this picture, and I'm, I was a bit too late on the draw. He got me before I did, got him. So the, who tells each other's stories now? It's also a, a walk into the Anthropocene. These are images created by an outfit in Canada called Globia, and they illustrate the human thumbprint on the planet. These, of course, are highways, uh, roads, pipelines, cities, agriculture, and uh, it shows how they're beautiful but also terrifying at the same time. These are air routes between... North America and Europe. Lots of straight lines, you notice. And these are shipping lanes uh, carrying cargo. Most of what we get in our stores that's imported comes via container ship. These are also oil tankers coming through the Red Sea. Again, beautiful, but somehow disturbing. So it's not just about a walk into the past. It's about a walk into our future, our collective future. Now. I'll be telling, writing long-form literary articles, but I'll also be doing more innovative work like taking what I'm calling narrative core samples every 100 miles along the route. Here's one that I took on a Raycon trip a few weeks ago to Djibouti. I take a satellite, uh, shoot the satellite to get geocoded information. I shoot a panorama, a 360 panorama. These are rocks, by the way, laid by nomads across a plane so they can not, my, uh, navigate during dust storms. I shoot a picture of the sky. I shoot a picture of the surface of the planet. And I find the nearest human being and interview that person with a set of questions about human identity. This is Mr. Mohammed Saeed. He was about 60 kilometers away. I asked them questions, who are you? 
Where did you come from? Where are you going? Questions I'll repeating systematically across the surface of the earth. He said, who's asking? <laughs> um, here's, a, here's a core sample from the finish line. That was near the beginning. Here's a core sample I took just two days ago from um, Tierra del Fuego. I just arrived last night. Wanted to see what the finish line looks like now versus in 2020 when I arrived. And this is it, the Beagle Channel. When I arrived there in 2020, I'm going to take off my hat, unlace my boots, and bow to the ghost of Darwin. There's the sky. And we can strip these cinematically across more than 200 core samples in seven years. There's the surface of the Earth. And you get this cinematic channeling that you'll be able to do through the wonders of technology. Um, this is Mrs. Cristina Calderon. She's 84. She's the last full-blooded fluent speaker of the Agan language. Um, and uh, that's the ethnic group, of course, that Darwin met when he took the voyage of the Beagle. And she rec I recorded some of her, her voice. Ultimately, though, the thing I need to, to summarize to conclude with before we go to questions is that this is what I love about this is this is a journey. It's not mine, guys. It's, it's yours. It's everybody's. Um, it's a journey we've all, we can bring the lights up, thank you. Um, we've all taken, and I love that. Because when I was sitting in that shack in West Texas, I didn't just want to write the most sweeping travel log I can think of, Paul Salopek's ramble across the planet. I wanted to tap into that universal notion of the quest. Travel stories are one of the oldest tropes in storytelling, and I thought, what would be the travel log that includes all of us. So it's not just my boots, it's every one of yours that's walking along. And it is the first human dispersal out of Africa. So I do welcome you to walk along. We'll have a couple websites up. Um, National Geographic will be running a ton of my journalism. Uh, the Knight Foundation has been kind enough to fund an independent site uh, that will run some of these core samples that we'll be taking across the world. Um, it'll also be the archive for the uh, journey's uh, journalism. Um, so starting in January, I uh, look forward to hearing from you. I appreciate it much, and I thank you much for coming tonight.